So, 15 minutes, not a long time. We're going to look at the code for this NFT, deploy it using Chainlink data feeds for the price of the asset that we'll be monitoring, uh, Chainlink automation so that I don't have to click a button all the time, and then also VRF to make the background a little more interesting. So with that, what is it going to look like? What's this thing that we're building going to actually look like? Maybe we can get the screen up there. There we go. Okay, so this is the NFT that we'll be building. This NFT is 100% on chain. The image itself is an SVG. SVG is a scalable vector graphics, a way of using code, a string essentially, to represent an image. And so we'll be building this, uh, which will change the emoji based on ETH's price going up. It'll be happy, down, sad or staying the same, we've got this kind of flat face. So I mentioned that we'll be using price feeds. Docs.chain.link, the documentation for all of Chainlink's products. Uh, we essentially, in this demo, will be doing the developer secret of control C, control V, copy paste, uh, and smashing together three different example contracts into one big contract with a few little things changed. One thing to note, this address here is going to change depending on what network you're on or what uh, asset pair you're looking at. So in the documentation, there is a list of all the different price feed addresses, all the different networks that they're on as well. And you can see here, based on which asset pair you're looking at, the address will change. Just something to keep in mind. The example I'm going to be doing is on the Fuji testnet, uh, whereas the documentation for most of our stuff is using the Go Early testnet. So if it looks a little different, than just straight copy-paste, that's why. Next, we'll be getting a random number using Chainlink VRF, verifiable randomness function. Uh, once again, we will be copying essentially this exact example contract into our contract, and I'll walk you through what all this stuff is doing. Um, and remember, different networks, different addresses, so supported networks for VRF are here, along with the different addresses for those as well. And then finally, we'll be using Chainlink Automation to make it update itself on a regular cadence. Uh, I'll be setting it to do like a one minute interval. So every, in, every minute, it should be updating itself. And yeah, we'll have an on-chain SVG that tracks the price of ETH. So what does this actually look like? If we dive into the actual code here, we've got a smart contract. Uh, I'll try to keep this brief. But we import some Open Zeppelin contracts. Open Zeppelin is kind of a standard of contracts. Those are going to be the contracts that let us create the NFT, the ERC721 contracts. Uh, the URI storage contract is where we store that metadata for the NFT. Metadata are things like the name, the description, that image that we'll be changing. Uh, we pull in a couple utilities, strings and base64. Strings lets us turn things that aren't strings. Uh, normally, you think of it as like text into strings, so taking a number, turning it into text. Uh, and then base64 lets us encode the values into base64 encoding. We can take a look at what that looks like, but essentially it needs to be wrapped up in base64 encoding before it's stored in the NFT itself. We import some Chainlink contracts here. We have our aggregator interface. That's going to be for that price feed. We have our VRF coordinator and consumer. So the way VRF works is you make a request to the coordinator, it goes out to the Chainlink Oracle network, says, hey, we need a random number, it gets one back, and then as a consumer, it reaches back into your contract and provides your contract with that random number. We define our contract here, DNFT. We let it know that's ERC721 with that URI storage and that it's going to be that VRF consumer. Essentially, this is letting it use all those contracts that we imported up above. We set a bunch of different variables here. So starting with the previous price of ETH, uh, We'll be using that for comparing to see how we're doing. We set our indicators. Those are those emojis that we'll be setting in our SVG. We have a array for all the different hex digits. We'll be using that for that random color. That's the random background color of the SVG. Uh, this, if you look at the documentation, will look very familiar to the example that we mentioned earlier. Uh, we set up our coordinator interface as well as the aggregator for our price feed. We store a, or we create a variable subscription ID. We're defining here the coordinator's actual address. Remember, addresses and that hash value 
will change depending on what network you're on. We set a callback gas limit. This is going to set a like, top threshold for when VRF comes back into our contract and calls the fulfill random words function. Uh, this gas limit is probably way higher than I need it to be, but we're on a test net using not real money, so that's great. Um, if you wanted to do this in a real world scenario, you'd want to know what a realistic top limit is for what you'd want. If you wanted to ensure that your contract ran, like, sure, set it high, right? But that can come with its own risks. Confirmations is how many block confirmations need to go by before we get that random number back. The lower it is, the faster we get our random number. The higher it is, the more secure it is because you've had more blocks go past. Number of words is from that VRF contract uh, example. In the example, it was two. Here we're using it six because that's the number of digits in a hex color, right? We have six different places in a hex color. So that will be those six random values that come back for VRF for our background color. We have an array to hold the random values that come back, and then we have our owner of this contract. Whew, a little bit more setup, and then we'll get to the actual like, interesting stuff in this. We have our constructor. Uh, the constructor takes in a subscription ID. That's because Chainlink VRF requires that you let the contract know about a subscription you create for VRF, and then within VRF, you'll need to let VRF know about the contract address. You'll see that in a minute when we deploy this. Uh, we set up the name of the NFT here, calling it ETHWATCH SVG, or EW SVG. Uh, and then we set up our coordinator address for VRF as well. We set up the price feed. Remember, that's the ETH USD price feed. It's going to be specific to the Fuji network. And we set up our coordinator, set up our subscription, our owner. And finally, we mint an NFT. This is going to be good. It's kind of weird to mint an NFT in your constructor, but since we're only creating one NFT, we'll do it here when we deploy the contract. We'll actually create that NFT. OK, so we set everything up. Right? We have our NFT, in theory, created. We'll see it once we actually deploy. Then we're going to request random words. So request random words, again, is what we'll reach out to the VRF coordinator and say, hey, I'd like some random numbers, please. And then we'll wait for those random numbers to be generated and then come back on chain. When they come back on chain, they will use fulfill random words to actually bring that request and provide those random words to our contract. So when this function is called, we'll store those random words and then we will run this update SVG function with those random words. So update SVG is going to actually create the SVG image, so that image that is the NFT, and we'll take a look at how it does that. So the first thing it does is it will call another function, build SVG. So first we go into update SVG, that calls build SVG. So let's step out and look at build SVG. Build SVG, you pass in the six random numbers. With those, we generate six random hex digits and store them in this fill color string. So that's going to be, if you're familiar with like hex random or hex colors, it'll be that, right? So based on the array that we created before with the hex values. So we'll store that and then we'll create the actual SVG string itself. I've broken it into three parts. Uh, the first is head. That's going to be the definition of the SVG itself. It's got things like the size here. And within this too, we have a rectangle that takes up the entire size of our SVG, and it's filled with our fill color. That's that random color. In the body, we have a text field that's going to be based on the emoji. So our emoji is just essentially text, and we get that from compare ETH price function. We'll take a look at that in a moment. And the tail is just that closing SVG element. We use ABI and code packed. Essentially what that's gonna do is gonna take those three strings, smash them together into one string, and we return that one string. So within here, we had our two functions that we called. The first was random hex digit. Essentially what that does is it takes in that random number. It runs this percent, which is a modulo. It's gonna give you the remainder when you divide it by the number of possible hex digits that we have. This is how we get from that array our random digit back. And so it returns that random digit. We also had compare ETH price which will take the current price via get ETH price function right here. This is literally a copied and pasted from our documentation to return the current price based on our oracles. And it will just compare it here. We're saying, you know, if it's greater than, set the happy face. If it's gone down, set the sad face. Otherwise, we'll set that flat face and return that value. So that's the emoji coming back. Okay, so we've created the string that is our SVG at this point. 
We stored it in this variable final SVG. Now we need to create the actual like metadata for the entire NFT. So that's what we'll do here. The first thing to notice is this is that base64 encoding happening. So this is where we're going to encode what follows in base64. So within here, we have another ABI encode packed. Remember, that's what smashes into one single string. We have the name, the description, we have the image. So we pass in this little bit of identification data here, data, image, SVG, base64. We base64 encode our SVG itself. So it's kind of like a double-decker taco from Taco Bell, where you have like two base64 wrappings there. We get all that base64 encoded goodness, store it in this JSON value. Whew, we're almost done. We use one more ABI encode packed to combine that with another little bit of identification data telling that it's application JSON base64 encoded data. And then finally, we set the token URI or the metadata for our NFT. So that is like super fast, all the code that you'd need to do this. There will be a slide with a link to a repository with all this code later if you haven't like taken notes and written it all down while I've been talking. Um, so let's deploy this and see what it looks like. When we deploy it, if you remember in the constructor, we had to have a subscription ID. That's going to be for VRF. So let's create a VRF subscription. We'll create a subscription here at vrf.chain.link. Confirm this. Wait for a moment and hopefully things go. Yep, add some link to this. Confirm that as well. So this is creating that subscription. It's basically a bucket of link that can be used by multiple consumers. So we'll need our subscription ID before we deploy the contract. Put our subscription ID in here, deploy the contract. Once this contract is deployed, we'll take its address and let VRF know about it. So at this point, once this is confirmed, then we can call VRF manually. So if we go back to our contract and we say request random words here, anytime we call this, it's going to update the SVG. I am lazy and don't like clicking buttons till eternity, so we will use Chainlink automation to automate this call. But before we do that, let's see if perhaps we can view this in OpenSea. It may not be here yet. Sometimes OpenSea takes a second. Looks like we're in luck. Maybe not. Sometimes OpenSea takes just a second to, to catch up. While we wait for OpenSea, we'll register a new upkeep. You can do custom logic, which will let you do based upon certain uh, Boolean, returning a Boolean value based on whatever parameters you'd like to check. Or we can do time-based, which is kind of based on a cron tab. So we'll put in our contract address here. It can't fetch the ABI. That means that the contract's not verified. It doesn't know what functions are available. So in Remix, if you go to the Compile tab, you can just copy the ABI from here and paste it in. Click Next. You'll remember we want to call Request Random Words. That's the function that will automate. Uh, we'll want to do this. Sorry, that's probably really tiny. We'll want to do this not every 15 minutes, but I said every one minute. So we'll set that up. Click Next. Uh, give it a name. Give it a gas limit that is, again, ridiculously high, but for the demo, it should be good. Uh, we'll put in our email address just in case anything goes wrong. It will let us know. Oops. All right, and we'll register this upkeep. You confirm the job contract being deployed and then confirm the actual upkeep itself. We'll wait for that. We'll see if OpenSea is caught up. Okay, so OpenSea shows nothing. OpenSea caches your NFT data. With dynamic NFTs that change, you sometimes need to click this Refresh Metadata button. And sometimes OpenSea is a little wonky. There we go. So the first time it ran, right, ETH was zero, and then we checked. So like, yay, we're doing good. Checking every minute based on data feeds, we may not always see a change. So depending on what has happened, it'll most likely be that flat face next. But let's take a look at our keeper here. We can view our upkeep and see if it has run yet. So here we have the history. You can see we funded it, and hey, perform upkeep has already run once while we've been waiting. If I refresh this metadata now and refresh, you can see the background color changed, the emoji changed. So 
since it checked last time, the price hasn't changed. So I think that's pretty cool, right? Like we've got on-chain NFT. It's an emoji, but it's, you know, maybe more interesting than red and green bars. So the code is here on GitHub. If you'd like to look at this code yourself, uh, that link will take you to that GitHub, or you can scan that. I am Richard, and thank you. I'll be around for questions afterwards if y'all want to chat. Thank you.